This is video three of chapter eight, so we're picking back up with formal charge here. What formal charge is, is kind of a way of bookkeeping and keeping track of the number of electrons and how it's distributed. So it has a really set formula here. To find formal charge of atoms, so you're finding it of each atom, you're gonna take that atom's number of valence electrons based on the periodic table, you know, his group number, minus the number of bonds around him, minus the number of lone electrons. Another way of saying that is take your valence from the periodic table, minus the lines, minus the dots. I'll show you what I mean. So if we look at this guy, for example, if we focus on phosphorus, on the periodic table, I know he has five valence electrons because he's in group five. Then I look at the structure and I do minus the lines. Well, he has four lines around him, minus the dots. He has no dots directly around him. So five minus four minus zero is plus one. That means phosphorus here has a plus one formal charge. All of these oxygens are identical. Let's find the formal charge of him. Oxygen on the periodic table is in group six, so he has six valence electrons. Minus the lines, he has one line here. Minus the dots, and he has six dots. So he becomes a minus one charge. With formal charge, all of the individual charges have to add up to the overall charge of the ion. So if you're a neutral compound, then all of your formal charges should add up to zero. But if you have a charge, then these individual formal charges should add up to that value, like this one adds up to minus three. Here, to give phosphorus a double bond is actually beneficial. You will not have to come up with this, but what I would want you to be able to do is compare these two structures and decide which one is best. So we're wanting to make sure that no rules are violated, like the octet rule or the expanded octet, everything is correct. And then you look at formal charges. So if we look at this guy and find formal charges, focus on the P for a second this time. On the periodic table, he has five valence minus the lines. He now has one, two, three, four, five lines around him and no dots. So he actually now has a formal charge of zero. That is better. What we're gonna see is that atoms are more stable if they have a zero formal charge. These oxygens are not all identical. There's three of them that are, so let's find their formal charge. You take oxygen who has six valence, minus the line, which is one, minus the dots, which is six. So he has a minus one, he has a minus one, and he has a minus one. This oxygen's different. He's the one that made a double bond. So oxygen still has six valence on the periodic table, minus two lines, minus four dots, so he is zero. So it still adds up to a total of negative three. That's not the difference. The difference is that there are some zeros here that had charges in the other one. So this right picture is a better, more stable Lewis structure, and it's what the compound actually looks like in real life. So lower formal charges means that you are more stable. We now know how to find the formal charges, and it helps us just compare two different Lewis structures. Another thing that comes up with Lewis structures is what's called resonance. So resonance is when you have multiple Lewis structures that describe the molecule. What I should say really quickly is up here, this molecule to the right, the PO4 minus three actually exists like this. This doesn't flip back and forth. They're not both the best structure. This PO4 minus three is better than the left side. Okay, so those are not resonance structures. What resonance structures are, is when you have Lewis structures that are absolutely identical in how good they are, okay? Let me show you an example and then I'll talk more about what that means. If we were coming up with the Lewis structure CO3 minus two, carbon has four valence, oxygen has six valence, and there's three of them. And then you have a negative two charge, which means you have an extra two electrons, so you come up with 24. So you go and draw your structure. You put carbon in the middle, oxygen on three sides, and what you would do at first is put a single, a single, a single. You'd fill up the O's, and then you would be out of electrons. That would be 24, and carbon would be short, correct? Well, when you run out of electrons, you have to share some more. So we shared here in order to make a double bond, but do you see that there are three identical options here? Any of the three oxygens could share the electrons. And you would get two singles and a double, two singles and a double, two singles and a double, all with C and O. 
So not one of these is any better. The formal charges would line up to be the exact same. They would add up to negative two in every case, and they're um, all good structures. So what we know in real life is that CO3 minus two does not look like any one of these. It's actually a, an average of these three structures. So there's actually like a one and a third bond, one and a third bond, and one and a third. One and a third, one and a third, one and a third. Clearly we can't draw a one and a third bond. So instead we draw what are called resonance structures, which are these three structures that are showing, hey, the molecule really looks like a spread of us. None of us are good by ourselves, but the molecule looks like a blend of these three or a hybrid of these three. It only happens when you have those multiple options that are identical, okay? O3 would be another example. So you've got three oxygens, each with six valence electrons, so you get to 18. You put the three O's in a line. You would start with single and a single and fill up the outers. And once you filled up the outers, you would be out. Oh, I'm just realizing I drew this incorrectly. We would actually need to make a triple bond and a triple bond because do you notice this middle oxygen is um, still, it doesn't have an octet yet. So the O3 here is not a good example. I will update the filled in guided notes to show you that example. So CO3 minus two, great example of resonance. And O3 will be updated. Okay, the last part of the chapter is looking at the strength of these covalent bonds. Okay, and we use what's called bond enthalpy. You should remember this word enthalpy from last chapter with delta H or two chapters ago. So this is the energy stored in different types of bonds. What I mean by that is between different atoms and single, double, or triple bonds have different enthalpies. Because remember we said that triple bonds are the strongest, they have higher bond enthalpies, whereas single bonds are really weak and they have really small bond enthalpies. It doesn't take a lot of energy to break them. One thing we also wanna know is that it always requires energy to break a bond. Okay, it always requires energy to break a bond, which means it's endothermic. And the opposite is true. When you form a bond, you're always releasing energy and that would be an exothermic process. Here in this table, we can see examples of bond enthalpies. They're in kilojoules per mole, so it's the energy required to break one mole of these bonds, okay? You can see that it's between different atoms and that there are double and single and triple bonds also. So how we use these to calculate bond enthalpy is like this, where it says memorize equation, but you're gonna have this available. You just need to know where it is. So here you take the bonds that are gonna be broken. Think about a chemical reaction. If this is your chemical reaction, you tell me which bonds are going to break. Well, it's the reactants that are gonna break and the products that are gonna form. So you take your bonds broken, that's the energy that's gonna be required, that's the reactants, and then you subtract the bonds that are formed in your products, okay? So first you'll need to draw your Lewis structures to determine what types of bonds you're working with. You also need to pay attention if there's coefficients. This example doesn't have coefficients, but if there were two CH4s, then that would mean I would have to break eight of these bonds because there would be two of these molecules involved. I personally like to pretend that every bond is broken and every bond is formed, even if there's some of the same on both sides. So if this example asked me what the overall bond enthalpy is here, I would draw out my Lewis structures. There's CH4, here's my Cl2, and here are my products. What I notice is that in the reactants, I've got four CH bonds that are gonna break and one CLCL bond that's gonna break. And then to form, I'm gonna form three CHs. I'm gonna bond, um, make one CCL and I'm gonna make one HCL, which I've listed here. Then I just go to the table and I bring down the correct numbers for each one. And then it just becomes, make sure we put it in our calculator correctly. And I get a negative 104 kilojoules, which if this is a negative enthalpy, remember back, that means that this reaction is overall exothermic. 
it released more energy than it required.